Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the U.S. Department of Transportation Asphalt Emulsions 102 Beyond the Basics webinar. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. Instructions will be given at that time. If time permits, the speakers will answer questions as we go through the webinar. If you should require assistance during the call, please press star, then zero. I would now like to turn the conference over to your host, Jason Dietz. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Anita. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jason Dietz, and I'm with the Federal Highway Resource Center, and I'm partnering with the Pavement Preservation and Recycling Alliance, also known as PPRA, on a series of these pavement preservation webinars focusing on pavement preservation. Today's webinar will focus on Asphalt Emulsions 102, Beyond the Basics. You will see a number of polls on your screen. We ask you to take a moment to answer those as we will close them in just a few minutes as time begins. We also encourage questions during the webinar and ask you to please take the time to respond to the evaluations at the end of the webinar. All attendants are on mute, but you can submit any questions through the chat function on your screen, and we will answer those as time permits. We will also be offering PDHs for today's webinar upon request. So please let us know after the webinar and provide us your email address and we'll like to, if you would like to receive those. This month's webinar is hosted by the Asphalt Emulsion Manufacturing Association, or also known as AEMA, EMA, and I'd like now like to introduce today's speakers. Our first speaker will be Sally Houston. She's employed with ArcMia Road Science and, technical, and she's a technical specialist supporting their asphalt emulsifiers and, and additive business in North and Latin America. She has been involved with the industry for 28 years and has been worked across the continent. She has worked in many aspects of asphalt, asphalt emulsions, and pavement preservation industries, including the formulation and the manufacturing of asphalt emulsions, manufacturers of laboratories, and pavement design and construction. She has contributed to the technical advancement and promotion of the industry through active involvement and research and development, committee work, and industry association. Sally lives in Davis, California, with her husband, Gary, and her two young children. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Andrew Graham, a graduate from the University of Wisconsin with a Bachelor of Science and a Master's of Science degree, and from the University of Illinois as well, with his PhD. He worked with Coke Industry, our Coke Materials Company, for two and a half years, and performed a postdoc at the Southeast University of Neijing, China. He is currently associate professor at the Civil Engineering Department at the University of Arkansas, where he teaches and re a research focus is on asphalt emulsions, pavement maintenance and rehabilitation, and sustainability. Sally and Andrew, on behalf of PPRA and Federal Highway, I want to thank you for your time today, and now would like to turn it over to you uh, for your presentation. Great. Thank you, Jason. Um, I'm very pleased to partner with Andrew today and um, speak to you guys about emulsions. I see a lot of familiar names and some that I don't know. Um, Jason, are we going to close these polls so I can see the presentation? So when we first started talking about what what Emulsions 102 presentation looks like, um, Andrew and I started chatting, and we were actually able to see each other uh, at ISSA workshop last week um, and go through some of it. But there were one of the things I realized, there's a lot of rabbit holes that I was starting to go down and um, trying to decide what it is I should actually bring to the table or we should bring to the table. So I think we've narrowed it down, but within this presentation are numerous other presentations that could spawn off. So we're going to gloss over some things and get more in depth than others. If you, I'm going to assume most of you have, are familiar with emulsion and emulsion chemistry. If not, you can, um, you can find some uh, previous webinars on YouTube on Emulsions 101. I'll give a kind of a brief um, reminder of the emul what asphalt emulsions are and the emulsifier chemistry today. We'll talk a little bit about asphalt. Um, what makes it an, a good asphalt for emulsions, 
and then we'll talk about emulsifiers and how we can impact our performance. And then Andrew will come in and uh, talk to us more, um, a little more in depth on some of the concepts I introduce, as well as talking about the uh, tests and uh, new recovery methods that are being introduced. So let's, t let's get into asphalt um, and where it comes from, what it is. Asphalt is uh, the heaviest component of crude, crude oil that comes out of the ground, right? It's a semi-solid refined material. It's uh, organic in nature, of course. It, it's primarily made up of car carbon and hydrogen atoms or hydrocarbons. There's minor amounts of uh, heteroatoms such as oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, and then there's trace metals in there. And you can see in that little table, it gives you a breakdown, um, kind of a range of, of the different components carbon and hydrogen, again, being the primary um, atoms in, in asphalt. There's lots of different functional groups um, that behave in different ways. Uh, asphalt is not 100% defined. It, it looks different depending on the crude source um, that it's refined from. But you'll see aromatic type materials, um, phenolic. You'll see uh, uh, nitrogen type ring groups sulfur types, and then you'll see things like sulfoxide and hydride, carboxylic acid and ketones. Those highlighted components, um, the, the, I highlighted those because you will form more of these as the uh, asphalt starts to age and you oxidize it. Okay, we're, we're missing part of my diagram here, but that's all right. There were some uh, tanks there, your, your atmospheric tower. So when we're refining asphalt, uh, there's different types of refineries, and I'm not going to get into those, but complex refineries, they, they can take off any number of uh, fuels from, from the crude oil, and then it's uh, at different temperatures. So if you, as you see here, like the very light, hot, low temperatures, you get things like your um, natural, uh, your gas liquids, your propane, butane, gasoline, jet fuels, your lighter fuels, and increasingly hot temperatures, you get your heavier fuels, such as your diesel and your um, fuel oils, like your number twos. And then at the once you've gone through the atmospheric tower, there's what are called the bottoms, and they would go into the vacuum tower. Um, as you may recall, things boil at a, at a lower temperature under vacuum. So you're going to take those heavy bottoms and further refine them into more gas oils, try and get as much, the refinery tries to get as much gasoline and diesel and other fuels out of it. And then at the very bottom is the residual where you get your asphalt. So um, the if a refinery has, you may have heard the term coker, they will, some refineries install a coker, which helps them to take this heavy component and break it down even further into gasoline and diesel. It takes the asphalt and breaks it down. And if they have their coker on, they're not producing asphalt, they're going to be producing these other, these other heavy oils. And that can be dependent on, for instance, the value of diesel at the time. If they're going to get more bang for their buck out of those fuels, then they're not going to be producing asphalt. The components of asphalt are often broken down into what we call the sera fractions, uh, the saturates, aromatics, resins, and asphaltines. And we can uh, analyze those using things such as an iatra scan. And the the sera kind of um, will contribute to the way that asphalt behaves. So your saturates are your carbon and hydrogen alkanes, long chain alkanes such as your paraffins, your cycloalkanes are your nap naphthenic saturates. Then you have your aromatics, which are benzene derivatives, and you have your um, double bonded uh, ring structures. And these kind of increase in polarity as you go down the line here. Then you have your resins, which have more polar in groups such as um, sulfurs or oxygens or nitrogens, and they'll have an alkane uh, tail, tail typically, and also the ring structure. And then you have your asphaltines, which are uh, polar as well. They're, they're uh, a larger, more complex 
um, set of rings and heteroatoms. They tend to be, um, they're defined as a solubility fraction. So when we're, we're fractionating, your asphaltenes are those things that precipitate an alkane, such as pentane or heptane. Now there's a lot of discussion about how these different components interact with each other in the asphalt. Um, there's the thought that the asphaltenes are uh, dispersed by the resins and the aromatics that kind of help keep them suspended in your, um, in your saturates. And uh, we do know that as your asphaltene component increases in the aging process, um, your asphalt tends to get more brittle. So when, when we started paving roads in the 1800s, most of the asphalt came from deposits in lakes um, or is mined out of this, these deposits of asphalt that were found in places like France and Switzerland. You've probably heard of the lakes in Trinidad, Venezuelan, uh, Bermudas, the LA, the LA um, La Brea tar pits in, in Southern California. And then as, um, as the oil boom started, we, we started getting our asphalt more from our distilled crude oils. Venezuela, soil and crude used to be the standard, right, for our asphalt emulsions. It made a great asphalt emulsion. Most of our asphalts come from what we call heavy crudes or sa and sour crudes. And um, they're found in places like the, in Canada, the US, South America, Saudi Arabia. We define the heaviness of the crude um, through the uh, API index, which is an inverse uh, relationship of the density of the crude oil. So the higher the number, the lighter the crude. Um, if, you've, if you've ever seen a hydrometer as a, as a means for measuring um, the density, that's, that's uh, one way you can measure the API index. So our heavy crudes tend to have an API value of 15 to 25. And then when we talk about sweet or sour crudes, um, that's the sulfur content. So if we have more than a half a percent um, sulfur content in our asphalt or in the crude, it's considered uh, sour. So again, most of our asphalt comes from these heavy sour crudes. And here's just some examples of the numbers for like Cold Lake out of Canada has an API of 20 and the sulfur content of three and a quarter. Um, Basra, uh, 24 API and sulfur content around 3.83. So these are typical for um, crude sources that, that give us good quality asphalt. There's different ways we can enhance the asphalt um, and how it performs aside from the emulsifier, which we're gonna get into here um, in a second, but we can use um, different uh, chemicals such as peptizers for difficult to emulsify asphalt. So we can add a, pep a peptizer into the asphalt to get it to emulsify better. And the concept behind, one of the concepts behind how that works is it helps um, disperse that asphaltine phase, uh, which may be agglomerating in your asphalt and make it difficult for it to emulsify. We can use adhesion promoters, um, and there's different chemistries behind that, but it helps promote the adhesion of the asphalt to the aggregate, and that's typically an amine type chemistry or a hydrated lime. We can put polymers in our asphalt or rubber. We do use a lot of crumb rubber in the California market. The easiest way is to use a latex polymer when we're making an asphalt emulsion to get those properties. You hear terms like rejuvenators, which restore that Sarah balance when we're talking about the aging of the asphalt and your um, increasing the amount of asphaltines and the brittleness of your asphalt. If you introduce a rejuvenator, it can act like those resins and kind of redisperse those asphaltines and give it uh, new life. And we can use stabilizers as well to help us with handling and mixing. So let's just go quickly through uh, emulsions again. I won't spend too much time on it because I'm assuming again that you're, you're fairly familiar. Um, and then we'll talk about emulsifier and, and how they can affect the performance of our emulsions. 
and um, how we can tailor those to our, our, our needs. So basics of the asphalt emulsion, two liquids, right, that don't want to um, mix. So that's typically an oil and water, especially when we're talking about asphalt, your oil phase, and, and then we have our water phase and our asphalt emulsions. And then we talk a lot about uh, emulsifiers, which is a surface active agent, um, or you might hear a term like surfactant or chemical, and that is there to help stabilize those droplets in your continuous water phase in the, in the case of asphalt emulsions. We're always trying to make a stable emulsion, right? So we can do that by um, when we make the emulsion, we want our droplets of our non-continuous phase to be nice and evenly suspended. We want them to have uniform size, and we want them to ha have a narrow size range, and we'll get into that a little bit more. If we have an unstable emulsion, typically the droplets um, are not of an even size, and they start to agglomerate or come back together. They start to do things like coalesce, um, flocculate. These are terms you may hear. And that happens when your system is out of balance. Maybe you didn't use the right temperatures when you were manufacturing. Um, you didn't have the right shear or pressure or the right chemistry. And you ultimately will end up with a broken emulsion where the two phases are separated again. Here's the distribution curves of a good versus or a stable versus an unstable emulsion. Again, um, we can run these in our laboratories on a particle size analyzer. And this is, this is the mean curve of um, the distribution curve of the emulsion drop, the asphalt droplets in the emulsion. So we want to narrow, this is a nice narrow curve um, distribution, and we want a small median size. So the median size of this emulsion here is around 2 to 3 microns, and it's all under 10 microns in size. And just to give you uh, an example, a, the human hair is about 50 microns. So these are all not visible. Um, with the naked eye. An unstable emulsion has a much broader uh, curve, distribution curve. You see here we have a median size of around 10 microns and 90% probably under, I don't know, maybe 50, 80 um, uh, microns. So that's, that's a, a larger particle size, broader distribution, not as likely um, to be stable. So we want to stabilize our emulsions using emulsifiers. This is the chemistry, and this is just a, a basic schematic of what that looks like. You have your tail, which is your hydrophobic component. That's your, this is just carbon and hydrogen um, oil-loving portion of the emulsifier. So this will be attracted to your oil phase, or in our case, the asphalt. Then you have your polar head, which is your hydrophilic component. It's water-loving. Um, there's usually a charge here, and that is the component that sticks out of your asphalt droplet. And, and also, this is the component you know, that gives charge to the system. Let's look at um, the different types of emulsifiers. You hear terms like cationic, anionic, um, non-ionic. So these are just based on the charge of the emulsifier. When we go to react it, uh, a cationic emulsifier will have a positive charge. An anionic will have a negative charge. We hear fancy terms like amphoteric. It's just a molecule that we can, we can treat either with an acid or a base and use it as either a cationic or anionic emulsifier. And then non-ionics tend to be neutral and not have a real charge on, on its surface or on its head, polar, polar head. This is the basics of how it works. That tail sticks into the oil droplet. And then you have your polar component with the charge on the surface of the, of the oil droplet. So here we have a, just a diagram of how um, we're stabilizing the asphalt droplets in the water phase. You've got the tail in, positive charge out. So you're creating a repelling force on the surface. And so the two molecules, like repels like, like when you try to stick the same um, ends of a magnet together, and they keep those droplets stabilized and apart from each other. We can control the stability of the emulsion based on the dosage of the emulsifier. So in this example, we have excess emulsifier. So we have 
emulsifier in the, in the water phase. We have the emulsifiers on the, on the surface of the oil droplet. And then when we go to mix, this is a, say, a typical aggregate will have a negative charge on a surface. The emulsifier uh, molecule is attracted to the surface of that aggregate. And then ultimately the free floating will go head that way. And then the emulsifier dro droplets that are on, um, or the emulsifier molecules that are on the oil droplets will head that way and bring those, the asphalt along with it. And ultimately it will coalesce on the surface of that aggregate. But we can control that through the dosage. Here's an example of uh, low emulsifier content. So that process will just happen a lot faster. So those um, emulsifier molecules, um, there's fewer free floating and there's fewer on the surface of the droplet. So that process happens a lot quicker and we call that a rapid, a rapid set or rapid break. So let's talk a little bit about emulsifier chemistry or what, what has been used historically for emulsifiers and today. Um, you may have heard terms pine, pine resin. There's, uh, you probably all know about the pine resin that comes from the hundred-year-old stumps in the Georgia, old Georgia pine forest makes a great emulsifier. We, use, we can use clay to, to emulsify asphalt and make a stable emulsion. Um, a lot of emulsifiers will come from either a tallow, which is a fat from the rendering process of livestock, or from paper mills, uh, like the craft paper process, we get a stream off of that that includes tall oils, fatty acids, and lignans. And all those can be modified um, to various degrees um, to, perform, to perform as emulsifiers and to make different emulsions depending on what properties you're looking for. Any more? Um, you know, the, the chemistry of emulsifiers has evolved. The, the manufacturers understand that by, um, by tweaking the type of head we have on the emulsifier, the chemistry we're using, uh, we can build more robust emulsifiers that can hold up to, um, that can be used, I guess, more across the board for varying raw materials, be it your asphalt or the type of aggregate you're working with. Um, we can, we can uh, tailor the emulsifier for the particular asphalt, the particular system, and we can optimize our performance to the desired properties that we're looking for. So this is just kind of your basic 101 on the type of chemistry. Uh, anionic emulsifiers um, typically are, have a carboxylic acid head on the surface. We'll take a tall oil uh, from from trees, uh, we can um, use lignus sulfonates. There's dip fatty acids. We can, and then we can modify them with a with that carboxylic head. And then when we go to use it as an emulsifier, we're reacting it with caustic soda, uh, sodium hydroxide, or potassium hydroxide potentially. And we're taking that carboxylic head, and we're removing that hydrogen and we're, we're leaving a negative charge on the surface. So that's where you're getting that charge and increasing the polarity and the repulsive nature of, of the head on the molecule when you go to emulsify. You might hear the term high flow to, uh, emulsions. They're anionic in nature, typically. And what we're doing is you can use molecules like crude tall oil you're creating what they, you call a gel-like structure with the asphalt. So the emulsifier works in conjunction with the asphalt. You can use a softer base asphalt or an asphalt that's been modified or cut with um, some sort of solvent. And when you, um, when you use the right emulsifier, you create this gel structure and it prevents the emulsion um, residue from bleeding or flowing. You can use it with uh, graded aggregate you get a nice thick film um, on the aggregate using this type of emulsion. And if you've wondered what that term means, this is a, just a diagram of the float test. You're plugging um, a hole essentially with your asphalt. You're floating it in warm water. And if that plug doesn't hold up, that means that you haven't created that gel-like structure. So you're wanting this, this to hold up, this plug. 
um, for a certain amount of time at a certain temperature to show that you've created that, that gel-like structure. So then we can talk about cationic emulsifiers, uh, most common being amine type chemistry. So you'll hear terms like fatty amines, amido amines, imidazolines, uh, you can use lignans, quaternary amines. Um, these are products of tallow or fatty acids that have been reactive to create the amine function that you want, be it primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. And you're taking the uh, amine, you're reacting it with acid, usually hydrochloric, and you're protonating, and you're creating that positive charge on the polar head or the functional group on that emulsifier. And um, depending on the type of chemistry or amines you're using, you can get various properties out of it. So I, I know there's lots of different properties we could discuss about emulsions, and we've all had properties we're looking for or issues with certain properties. But I'm going to touch on a few. Some I'm going to skim over, some I'll dive into a little more deeply. So let's talk about particle size, uh, stability, adhesion, the viscosity of the emulsion, and the uh, wetting properties of, of the emulsion or the surface tension. Particle size is, is a, a critical aspect of our emulsion. Um, I, it, it's a, I'm referring to it as a property because it's critical to the way that emulsion is going to behave in any application. And, the, and depend, it doesn't matter what type of emulsion you're trying to build. You want a good particle size. Uh, this, the particle size is a function of how you're manufacturing the material. Thermal, mechanical, and chemical energies all matter when we're making emulsions. The temperature of the asphalt, for instance, uh, it's going to lower the viscosity of that asphalt so it's, it's easy or at the right viscosity for emulsification. Uh, too hot, you may boil your emulsion. Too cold, your asphalt, you're not going to get the proper shear. Uh, the shear at the mill head is how fast shear mill is, is running. Um, we, we, they're colloid high shear mixers, the gap size in the mill, and the chemistry you're using to stabilize those droplets once you shear them um, into your continuous phase. All these things matter to your particle size. The interfacial tension, or the charge on the surface of the droplet uh, between the particles, um, is important. When you have oil and water that don't want to mix, the tension between the interfacial tension is very high between oil and water, and that's when you have uh, two different phases, right? They separate. And if we put in a multiplier in the system, we're going to reduce that tension. We're going to create a protective layer on that droplet, and we're also going to create a repulsive force between them to keep them from coming back together. You'll hear terms, and I'm going to let Andrew get into more detail about this than I will. Zeta potential is something that's still being discussed in the industry, but the dumbed-down version is you have your charge on your emulsifier droplet, I mean emulsifiers on your asphalt droplet. Uh, then you'll have a counter ion layer around that, uh, which is a little weaker than what you the, the charged head on, on the emulsifier. You can create an electrical potential that is measured, and this is going to be a function of the functional group on the emulsifier, the pH of your emulsion, the concentration of the emulsifier. Um, you, you could say that rapid sets typically have a higher zeta potential, um, and slower sets have a, lower, have a lower one. I'll get into a little more about um, when we talk about adhesion and zeta potential, but a higher zeta potential potentially um, improves the adhesion of, of the emulsifier and hence the asphalt to the aggregate uh, interface. We'll talk about that a little more. So I think I mentioned, uh, you've seen this picture, I'm just pointing out here that we want a mean particle size of a good emulsion somewhere in the 2 to 5 uh, micron range. We want the narrow distribution and there's different ways we can analyze the particle size, but we want 90% of the distribution to be under 8 microns. So that's just kind of, that's, that's a very generalization. 
The particle size is going to be very dependent on your manufacturing process if you're an emulsion producer. The type of mill you're using, the type of asphalt, chemistry, all of that is going to have some impact on um, what looks good coming off your mill versus somebody else's. So when particle size is a critical component of storage stability, you know, we want, we want, we want emulsion that we can store and uh, we don't want the manufacturing process to be the cause of, that, of the loss of storage stability. So making a good emulsion with a good particle size is going to prevent the separation in the tank. Um, the storage condi conditions are critical as well. You know, we don't want to overheat our emulsion in the tank and we certainly don't want it to freeze um, in the wintertime. Our pH, emulsifier, and the dosage of the chemistry can all affect that storage stability. If you know you're going to have something sitting in your tank for more than a couple of days, it's going to be weeks or months, then it's time to talk to your emulsion manufacturer or your chemical manufacturer about how to make that more storage stable. Your residue also impacts the stability of your emulsion. Um, a lower residue emulsions, for instance, if you cut an emulsion for, a, say, fog or tack, you're going to have a lot less stability um, storage-wise with that emulsion um, than if it was at full residue. Those particles settle out a lot easier um, if there's less of them. So uh, the stability of the emulsion can be affected by how much we're pumping it, whether we're spraying it through a nozzle, or whether we're mixing it with aggregates. Uh, we want to be able to control that with the type of chemistry we're using, which we can. Um, and we also want to make sure it's pump stable. But a lot of this also takes some forethought of the contractor or whoever's storing the emulsion. You, you don't want to over pump your emulsions. Um, you, you don't want to over shear them because you are contributing to uh, that emulsion uh, destabilizing every time you, you send it through a pump. So a lot of thought needs to be put into that. But a good stabilized, good particle-sized emulsion will hold up more than one that has a bad distribution. How can we improve the adhesion of, our, of, of the asphalt to the surface of the aggregate? Well, we can do that through the chemistry. I mentioned the zeta potential um, of the emulsifiers being used. Uh, that would be the surface active head. And you have um, varying um, degrees of zeta potential based on the type of emulsifier you're using. Typically, a cationic emulsifier is going to give you much better adhesion than, say, an anionic one. And we, um, we have a lot of chemistry at our hands where we can uh, create a cationic emulsifier that does any number of things. The amine type uh, chemistry is used um, as straight adhesion promoters, but a lot of our emulsifiers are also amine-based, so they can act at, as just an emulsifier and an adhesion promoter. So the idea behind the zeta potential and the cationic emulsifier is that that higher zeta potential is going to make that emulsifier um, uh, more attractive to the aggregate. It's going to preferentially attract the emulsifier to the surface of the aggregate where that negative charge is. Um, it's going to be preferential over water. So the idea being that the cationic emulsifier is going to displace the water molecules and form a bond that's going to bring that asphalt in and create better adhesion than, say, for instance, with an anionic emulsifier um, that will, does not have preferential attraction to the aggregate surface over water. So you may have to rely more on evaporation in the process using an anionic emulsifier versus the cationic emulsifier. All right. Can you all hear my dog whining in the background? <laughs> I apologize. She does this every time I present. She lays next to me and then talks to me. Uh, OK, so viscosity. We can control uh, the viscosity of our emulsion through, um, through the volume fraction, which would be the asphalt, right? So we have the dis dispersed phase volume fraction. So you can have a certain volume fraction um, based on kind of the binder itself and your residue. 
you can actually increase that volume fraction by creating a multi-layer um, um, emulsion system. For instance, a water and oil and water, depending on the emulsifier you choose, and that essentially uh, increases that volume fraction by the incorporation of water inside the oil. Um, smarter people out there to measure and do all that, but there are emulsifier choices that we can make or use to increase that volume fraction and give higher viscosities based on the type of chemistry we use. The particle size is critical to viscosity and the distribution. A nice narrow particle, I, you know, I keep tooting that horn, but we do want a, a, a nice small narrow distribution and particle size. We, um, from years of experience, I can tell you that if you have an emulsion that has a broad distribution band and has some larger droplets in there, um, it's probably going to fall apart a lot faster, but it's also going to dis display a, a, um, a, a lower viscosity than if it had been milled properly and the chemistry had been right and, and you got that good distribution. Salts in the uh, asphalt, or when you're making the emulsion, maybe even in your water phase, can increase viscosity, um, make it grow through osmosis. Uh, you can add salt to your emulsions to kind of stabilize that process so you don't get the growth. There's things like micelle formation. This would be more of how the emulsifier behaves in the water phase. Um, forming micelles that can contribute to viscosity build. Um, and that could also, you, you would see that potentially if you make your treated water and cool it down. If you have a thicker water, uh, treated water, then you probably have some micelle formation from the emulsifier in that system. Just understanding it is important and using it to um, your advantage. And then you can also increase, of course, your viscosity the old-fashioned way by um, increasing your binder content or more asphalt, higher viscosity. But it makes more sense to control that viscosity using the emulsifier than using the residue. When you're paying $500 a ton for asphalt and you need to go up 2% in your residue to get to your viscosity and spec, it makes more sense to change the emulsifier that you're using or um, control it with the emulsifier than to control it with the residue. So we can do that with different functionalities on the um, surfactant, the emulsifier head, and we have a whole host of options from very low viscosity to what we now call very high viscosity emulsions. Um, and that's all based on the type of chemistry you're using to manufacture with. So if we want to improve our wetting properties through reduced uh, surface tension, we can get things like better absorption into the aggregates and, and substrates. Two second intermission here. Hold on. The dog won. OK, I had to let open the door for her. OK, so we want to improve the wetting uh, properties so we can get better absorption into our substrates, quicker absorption. If you're, for instance, if you're working with a penetrating prime code or dust control, that would mean quicker traffic time, less pickup from the traffic, and you may eliminate the need for sanding um, after you apply your emulsion. So the, the idea is that you're getting the asphalt particles where they need to go, which is absorbed down into the substrate to create that hard um, sub or surface that you want either for prime and putting something on top of it or holding down those, uh, those uh, dust particles. So we can use the next generation of emulsifiers There's, um, to reduce the particle size. If the smaller the particle size, the easier it is going to absorb into the substrate. And also we can, it can serve a dual function of reducing that, that surface tension. It will also make it more compatible with uh, all kinds of varying substrates with high surface area components like clay. And here's just some example of different uh, substrates from all over the world that we looked at in our laboratory. Um, so we're improving that penetration into that tight surface. Here's a, 
um, a, a little bit on how, how we're doing that. If you remember studying um, capillary flow, this, the resistance to gravity, and if you have much smaller pore size, uh, it's harder to get that water down into that, through that pore, right? It's going to resist it. The, that's all created through the surface tension. And if we, um, if we can measure sole, the sole capillary radius, radius, the average around 6.8 microns, and we talk about our emulsion particle size, you can see the benefit of having a, a small, narrow distribution when we're talking about this. So what we're doing, essentially, is we're we're through the surfactant. Say, so imagine that this is the um, this is the aggregate or the 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 pore that you're trying to get through in your substrate, and this is your emulsion. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to reduce this angle so that this flattens out a little bit and reduces that surface tension, and that way you can make way for flow of the asphalt droplets because the water is the carrier, right? Through, through that pore size um, by reducing that contact angle. And it also, by reducing that angle, you have better wetting properties and better affinity for the substrate. So I think I've got some slides here that kind of repeat what I'm saying. But you're just improving, you're improving that, uh, that process. So here's just another diagram. The asphalt particle, again, is carried by the continuous water phase. You, don't, you, you want to make sure that the asphalt can make it through those pore sizes using better wetting chemistry. You, you want a low, a low viscosity emulsion. Typically, you're going to cut these emulsions, um, and that's going to help also with the flow. And you, get more, um, you can get more asphalt down where it needs and get deeper penetration and less capillary restriction um, based on the reduced surface tension and particle size. So these are all things, again, that we can control with, with the chemistry. So some of the adv other advances we've, ma we've made over the years is learning how to blend emulsifiers to get the properties that we want. We know that certain chemistries give us certain properties. We can use um, things like lignans to dis for dispersing uh, and stabilizing, non-ionics, for good wetting property and particle size. We can use our quaternary means for stability and any host of different types of amines um, for controlled break, for adhesion promotion, for good cohesion once we've got it in the mix. Uh, and you know we're moving forward with chemistries such as very rapid setting emulsifiers where we can get uh, even quicker break times out of say our, our chip seal emulsions without losing that adhesion property. And uh, we're also, you know, advancing in the way of, of prime, like I was just explaining, we don't need the solvents in our prime coats necessarily to get the penetration um, and the wetting properties uh, in those substrates. So always trying to move forward. The chemistry is always evolving. Um, you know, we're taking performance to the next level and tailoring it to whatever our end use is, which we know we have a whole host of ways we can use asphalt emulsions, and we're always striving to improve. So the agency ask could be, you know, how do we get these, get that performance? You don't necessarily need to understand the chemistry. You need to understand the performance that those chemistries can give you. So work with your emulsion and chemical expert, experts in your district. You know, partner with good experience contractors um, and be a willing partner. You know, we can't advance the chemistry if we don't all work together um, trying them out, promoting them, and, and proving them out in the field. So with that, I'm going to hand off to Andrew and he can take us uh, a little further down the road of testing and all that. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Sally. I appreciate it. And like Sally mentioned, uh, this it was a lot of fun putting this presentation together because there are a whole host of different directions we could have gone and a whole bunch of rabbit trails we could have gone down. So um, uh, Sally covered quite a few things. I'm going to highlight and um, go a little deeper into some of the things that she introduced and then also introduce some new concepts 
just so um, you guys have a better idea of, of what's going on with emulsions. So this is a figure that I actually generated, Asphalt Emulsion 101, where asphalt emulsion is defined as asphalt binder with one layer of emulsifiers on the surface suspended in water. And I, I stand by this definition, but it isn't quite the whole story. And if we start looking into the whole story, we realize that this is actually a simplification. So let's take a look at how we can start going beyond this simplification, which is a very important introduction, but um, not, not quite the whole picture. And in order to do that, I think it's very important to talk about how we characterize asphalt emulsion. So I'm sure a lot of people are very familiar uh, based on the pre presentation poll answers that were posted up on the screen. They're very familiar with AASHTO T59, which is divided into three different sections, emulsion composition, consistency, and stability. And this is where the composition portion consists of the water content test, the residue and oil distillate, evaporation, and particle charge. The consistency is the sabalt furyl viscosity test. And then the stability is demulsibility, settlement, cement mixing, sieve coating, miscibility, freezing, and storage stability. So you can see AASHTO T59, if you haven't taken a look at it, is a cornucopia of tests. It's actually quite interesting when you look through it all. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of different tests that you can run on the asphalt emulsion. And once you get through all of those tests, there's a whole other section about tests that you can run on the residue. And there are various ways to obtain the residue, which we'll talk about a little more. But tests we can run include penetration, ductility, ash content, the float test, which Sally mentioned before, elastic recovery, and the softening point. So there are a lot of ways to traditionally characterize asphalt emulsion. And with the second half of this presentation, the goal of the second half of this presentation is to kind of take that relatively narrow view and open it up a little bit. And we're going to do that starting with defining the asphalt emulsion. And that is because many of these tests are 50 plus years old and, and new things have happened since then. So this is the what I call the emul asphalt emulsion 102 definition. And as Sally mentioned, when you're looking at asphalt emulsion, there's actually the asphalt binder at the core. And then you can see in this image, there are, it's a positive emulsifier. So there are then emulsifiers surrounding the surface, but there's actually an electrical double layer. And that first layer of emulsifiers, the one that we traditionally think of as the emulsifier layer is called the stern layer. And that is considered to be part of the asphalt binder droplet. But moving out, we have a second layer of emulsifiers, which are not as, uh, well, they're not directly attached to the particle, and they're also a little loosely, more loosely packed, and that is called the slipping plane. So that is the double layer. You have the stern layer, and then you have the slipping plane. And then on top of that, outside of the slip plane, we actually have free floating emulsifiers, and these are called micelles. So we have our asphalt binder droplet in the center. We have the asphalt, the emulsifiers, excuse me, around that asphalt binder droplet. Then we have a second layer of loosely bunched emulsifiers. But then we actually have floating in the water micelles, which all lead to the stability. So this is just a way to recognize that how we typically think of asphalt emulsions is, is not incorrect, but it's not quite the whole picture. And everything we go, as we go deeper into it, um, these things are going to start becoming more important. So moving on from just AASHTO T59, let's think about some concepts of asphalt emulsion 102. And that includes introduction to the paddle viscometer, the particle size, which Sally's talked about and introduced already, zeta potential and Henry's equation, low temperature recovery methods, and then moving towards super paves. So these are the going to be the core of the six points that I'm going to cover in the rest of this presentation. I believe this is our next poll question. So as Jason pulls up the poll question, could you please indicate if you have run one of the following viscosity tests on 
asphalt emulsion. And I'll just give you a minute to, well, a couple seconds to put some stuff in. All right, so it looks like Sable Furel is a strong first place. It does look like a lot of you have run the rotational viscometer, which is what we traditionally use for super paved asphalt binder grading. And it does look like a fair amount of you, about a third of you, also run the paddle viscometer. So this is great. Um, looks like we've got a pretty diverse audience, and I think that's exactly what we are, are looking for. So let's talk about the paddle viscometer because in my mind this is the, the, the new test that most people are least familiar with but actually has, I think, quite an important application. So the paddle viscometer does have an ASTM standard. It's D7226. It's called Determining the Viscosity of Emulsified Asphalt Using a Rotational Paddle Viscometer. And there are two different, I, I at least sort things in my mind in two different ways, the spraying of asphalt emulsion and mixing of asphalt emulsion. So spray treatments include fog seals, chip seals, scrub seals, anything where you actually spray the asphalt emulsion onto the pavement surface. And you want to make sure that the uh, asphalt emulsion is thin enough to spray through the nozzles, but thick enough not to flow off the road. And there is a balance there. It's kind of like Goldilocks. You don't want it too thin, but you don't want it too thick. And then from the mix side, which is more like slurry seal, uh, microsurfacing, cold in place recycling, hot in place recycling, those type of things, the asphalt emulsion viscosity can give you an indication of workability and film thickness. Now there's a very nice paper put out about 15 years ago that actually looked at the Sabalt viscometer versus the rotational viscometer versus the paddle viscometer. And uh, the paper led off by talking about how the Sabalt viscometer is the traditional viscosity test for asphalt emulsion. Now it also started going into some details about the rotational viscometer. And interestingly enough, if you dig down into the theory behind rotational viscometers, the, the whole point of dropping your spindle down into that cup and spinning it, it assumes that you have homogeneous shear conditions between the spindle and the cup itself. And uh, as we've seen, asphalt emulsion is not homogeneous. So we could have a very robust discussion as to whether or not we have homogeneous shear conditions when we're testing asphalt binder in the rotational viscometer. Therefore, the paddle viscometer is of great interest. And this is where there is a cup, and there's a little four-finned paddle that's dropped in there. And the paddle spins around, so you're measuring the resistance to that spinning. So it's similar to the Brookfield, but instead of looking at a shearing motion, it's looking more of a, uh, a stirring motion. And in fact, this paper that was published in 2005 showed that the paddle viscometer show, had the best correlation to Sable and had an R square of around 0.9. So that's pretty promising that we're heading in the right direction into getting uh, test results similar between the Sable and the paddle viscometer. Now, Sally had introduced uh, the concept of particle size. I don't know about you all, but I the term micrometer really has very little meaning to me. It's very small, that's all I know. But what do you think the average diameter of a human hair is? And as I said, no Googling. Oh, but man, the, you guys are hitting it pretty, pretty solidly. So the average diameter of a, a human hair is anywhere from about 40 to 90 uh, micrometers. So the 50 is the average. Anyone who's guessed 100, though, I'll give partial credit to, maybe 50% maybe credit, because you're kind of within that range. But yes, the average diameter of a human hair is about 50 micrometers. So we take a look at the particle size. As um, Sally mentioned, we do want smaller, tighter distributions. Now, something that I always think is interesting is the vast majority of presentations when they show particle size, they showed the smoothed, um, smoothed data that's automatically output for most programs that run particle size. And uh, Pedro Diaz Romero, he's actually on this webinar. He's one of my fantastic graduate students. He made this graph from the raw data. So 
particle size isn't always a beautiful parabolic distribution or bell distribution. Usually there's a little bit of messiness to it. So this is an actual particle size distribution recorded in our lab. And in general, as Sally mentioned, smaller, tighter distributions are preferred. However, particles can be too small. You don't want them to get too small or else you have a whole host of, of different problems. But they can also be too big. So again, we got Goldilocks in the room, and you want to have kind of in that middle ground. And unfortunately, at this point, I can't sit here and say, if you have this type of asphalt emulsion, this is the particle size you want. This is kind of an open-ended question right now, because particle size is a function of charge, reactivity, and chemistry. And here's what I did, is I created a new, a new unit for particle size. We'll see if it catches on, but it's the hair width particle size. And so if you assume that the average hair width is 50 microns, you can see that this particle size is anywhere between uh, zero microns, obviously just over zero, and about three-tenths of a hair width. So if you pluck a hair off your head and you take a look at that diameter, 30% of that diameter, that is considered a large asphalt emulsion droplet. So it's very, very, very small sizes when we're talking about asphalt emulsion droplets. Now, I just mentioned that I can't sit here and tell you what the proper definition of um, particle size is for different reactivities, but we're working on it. And I've had a couple students now who have worked on this, and the different quantifications that we're exploring are D10, D50, and D90. So D10 is about where 10% of the particles are smaller than the, the D10 size. So two microns is the D10 of this distribution. The D50 is where 50% of the particles are smaller than the size listed here, which would be 8.3 microns. And then D90 is 27.8 uh, microns. So 90% um, of the particles are smaller than 27.8. And the nice thing about these units is you're starting to look at what is the width of this distribution and where is it along that diameter scale. Another unit that we've been playing around with is the span. This is another way to capture the width. It's simply the D90 minus the D10 divided by the D50. And then you can also quantify the standard deviation and variance, the mean, the median, and mode. So when we're looking at a particle size distribution, um, you may see some numbers reported. D50 is very popular, but that really only gives you a window into understanding the size of these particles. And it's my personal opinion that we need to be looking at different areas of the graph, whether it's D10, D90, or span, in order to better understand how the distribution is actually set up. Now, there has been some published data with um, particle size. So uh, my previous grad student, Logan Kynell, he looked at paddle viscosity versus particle size, and he explored various emulsifiers, emulsifiers and dosages. He looked at different pH levels in the soap solution. And then he also, we have a little small recirculating mill, so he did, looked at different recirculating times. And he looked at cationic slow set, or CSS emulsions, and cationic medium set, or CMS emulsions. And based on his correlation between particle size and paddle viscometer, viscometer uh, this is some of the preliminary recommendations that he made. So for example, I'll just read off that top line, but for CSS emulsions, he recommended that the D10 be greater than 2.2, and the mean of the D10 should be 2.4. The um, D50 should be greater than 4.0, and the mean of the D50 should be 4.4. And he did something similar with the CMSs. But you can see here that based on just these two different reactivities, they're both cationic, but one's slow set, one's medium set, we actually had slightly different recommendations for particle size, and it, it changed as you went through these different um, parameters. So. These are very, very preliminary results. I don't pretend that these should be like implemented tomorrow, but I think that this is a discussion that we need to start having in a community as to whether or not we want to start looking at particle size a little more closely. And uh, Pedro, he is continuing t with this work, but I was actually um, transforming into 
uh, performance tests as well because obviously we can look at asphalt emulsion all day long but until we actually start looking at it with um, for example chip seals and the sweep test or CIR and um, some sort of raveling test or shear test it's, it's just kind of academic so uh, Diaz Romero is continuing looking at these particle size recommendations incorporating performance tests with aggregate into the decision making process and then Ashley Buss, unfortunately, um, Dr. Buss, she, well, fortunately for Iowa DOT, but unfortunately for the academic world, she decided to go from Iowa State to the Iowa DOT. So if anyone's on here from Iowa DOT, you guys got a winner with Ashley. But Dr. Buss, she published a paper in 2018 where she defined CRS2 having a mean D50 of 11 microns, and then... Um, the CRS2P, so polymer modified cationic rapid set, was bimodal, and the first peak was at three microns, and the second peak was at 10 microns. So th again, this is just kind of an introduction to some potential path forwards on how we could start trying to quantify particle size and relate it to actually quality and performance of asphalt emulsion. Now, moving on to zeta, zeta potential. Zeta potential is a very interesting phenomenon, and this is something that I'm very keen on learning more about. But uh, as an overview, the zeta potential is the difference between the bare particle slipping plane and the aqueous solution, or the bulk solution. So this is the view that we saw earlier on a slide, and what's going to happen is this graphic is going to be shifted up to the left and we're going to look at some details on this graphic after shifting it. But keep this particle and configuration in your mind, and it's going to be shifted up to the left. And we've got some axes here. So we have the um, charge on the y-axis and the distance from the surface in nanometers. So this is even smaller than micrometers. I, I can't even think about human hair being this small. But um, it's basically charge versus distance from the surface. And so we have the particle size potential, which is the surface potential, which is right at the interface between the asphalt binder and that first layer of emulsifiers. And then the bare particle slipping plane and or the zeta potential is actually between that first layer of emulsifiers and that second layer of emulsifiers. So that stern layer is where the zeta potential is actually being measured. Then we also have the diffuse layer potential, which is pretty much anything beyond that zeta potential, because as you move away from that particle, the uh, emulsifiers get fewer and fewer, so you have what's called a diffuse layer potential, and that's when you start getting into the micelles as you get far over to the right from the surface of the, the particle. And Sally uh, briefly alluded to this before. I think this is also some concepts that are, are not necessarily 100% known in the emulsion community, but zeta potential can indicate stability and in general a higher zeta potential equals better stability. But you need to be a little bit careful with this because if you're looking at different reactivities, so a slow set versus a medium set versus a quick set versus a rapid set emulsion, you need to be very carefully because the charges may have different ranges. So cationic rapid set emulsions tend to have less stability than slow set but the slow set may actually have higher zetas because they're a different type of emulsion. So I think, again, this is an area that is wide open, but I think there is a lot of potential for the zeta potential uh, moving forward, and I think it's definitely something that we should spend some more time looking at. So some uh, general guidelines with the zeta potential. There has been limited amount of published work on this, but it is defined as the potential difference between the solid surface, which is the particle itself, and the aqueous solution, which is the bulk liquid. And again, in general, a larger zeta equals a better stability. And I put larger in quotes because anionic emulsions have a negative zeta potential, so a larger negative number would have better stability, and a cationic emulsion has a positive zeta potential. And again, uh, Dr. Buss and her uh, student Irvin Pinto in 2020 found out that greater than 30 is good for zeta potential for CQS emulsion. And... Um, 
They also found that zeta potential changed if you modify the pH of the soap solution, the emulsifier loading, and the temperature. So again, I think there has been some preliminary work, just like particle size with zeta potential, but I do think there is a lot more to go as we move forward in the future. So kind of pivoting away from the uh, particle size and the zeta potential, moving into emulsion recovery, or emulsion residue recovery, the next poll question is, have you, you run one or more of the following, the AT59, which is the distillation test, the Ashto R78, which is the low temperature evaporation, and ASTM D7403 or uh, D7227, which is the um, vacuum or pressure usage in getting your recovery. All right, so the the answers as they're popping up, this is this is pretty reasonable. The T59, that's the go-to for getting our asphalt emulsion residue from an asphalt emulsion sample. I think from a research standpoint, the, the two ASTMs there are by far the uh, most research grade, so I don't expect as many people to use those. But I think that the community is recognizing that um, T78 has some traction. And uh, you can see just about a third of the people on this call have, have run T78, which is great. All right, so when we think about asphalt emulsion residue recovery, um, asphalt emulsion, it's required for transportation and placement. So you can see an anionic chip seal emulsion being placed here on the right. It needs to be in the emulsion form in order to transport it to the job site and then spray through those nozzles in that beautiful triple overlap that you see in the, the picture uh, and place it on the road surface. So you have a nice, thin, homogeneous layer of asphalt emulsion. Now, there's two ways that water can then leave the system because asphalt emulsion is generally about 30% water. Um, and the water can leave the system either by simply evaporation or it can leave chemically through a chemical break. Regardless of how it works, though, only your asphalt emulsion residue remains. And obviously, the long-term behavior of the asphalt emulsion residue is of high interest. So uh, things like the particle size and the zeta potential are very interesting because we need to manufacture the asphalt emulsion, we need to store it, we need to transport it, we need to place it. But then long-term, the only thing that's left is the asphalt emulsion residue. The water eventually leaves the system, so the long-term behavior of the asphalt emulsion residue is of great interest. And there are three types of ways to get emulsion residue. The distillation, which is the T59, the low temperature evaporation, uh, which is the R78, and then there's a couple different ones with vacuum and pressure, which we'll cover as well. So to start out with the distillation, for those of you who have run a distillation test, this is a very familiar setup right here. Essentially what happens is you heat the asphalt emulsion sample to 260 degrees Celsius for about 15 minutes. You let it cool and you can test the residue. Unfortunately, there's some potential issues with this. First, the emulsions never reach 260 degrees in the field unless you're placing emulsion on Venus or something. This won't happen. So this is not representative of what happens in the field. And one thing that we're very aware of is that heating the asphalt emulsion to 260 degrees Celsius can literally burn polymers and latex that you may have in your asphalt emulsion. So for example, if you're testing elastic recovery and you run the distillation, you may not be capturing the entire benefit of that polymer because some of it may have burned if you use the distillation procedure to get your sample. Now, low temperature evaporation is something that's been gaining some traction. Here, basically what you do is you take a silicone mat and you place a very thin layer of asphalt emulsion down on the silica mat. And there's two procedures that you can use. Procedure A is that you place the emulsion down at approximately two millimeters. You heat that small sample, the very thin square sample at 25 degrees Celsius for 24 hours and then 60 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. But you can imagine that uh, no one really has 48 hours to make residue samples. That's an incredibly long time, especially if you're doing some um, quality assurance in the lab. So there's also procedure B, which is where you place 381 micrometer thick sample down. 
and then you uh, age it at 60 degrees Celsius for six hours. So it's a little thinner, but it's also a much shorter aging time. So this procedure B is actually the one that's been catching on. Now, finally, the more research grade uh, types of ways to obtain residue is you can do it through vacuum or pressure. So ASTM D7403, you place the uh, sample in a chamber at 135 degrees Celsius for 60 minutes, just under atmospheric pressure. So it's actually a small vacuum, and that kind of sucks some of the water out. The simple aging test, or SAT, I apologize. I could not find either an ASTM or an AASHTO specification for this test. If I am mistaken, please, please, please put it in the chest chat box, but I was not able to find one. Uh, but the procedure for it is you put um, a 30 uh, micron thick sample of asphalt emulsion at 60 degrees Celsius for six hours. Then you put it in a PAV, a pressure aging ves vessel, for eight hours at 100 degrees Celsius and 20 ATM. So you apply pressure to that. And then uh, there's also many uh, proprietary drying systems out there. I, I didn't want to get into all those details, but if you take a look at ASTM D7227, that is one example. But you can also just uh, Google asphalt emulsion drying systems or something along those lines, and a bunch of proprietary products will come up, which are kind of uh, just different combinations of temperatures and pressures to get your asphalt emulsion residue. Now, once we have this asphalt emulsion residue, and I realize that I'm going through uh, quite a bit here, but I do want to leave some question, time for questions at the end. I notice people are putting questions in the chat box, which is awesome, and I notice that Sally has answered a couple of them already, so I appreciate that. Um, but I do want to talk about kind of some of the latest and greatest activities, and that's how when we're looking at asphalt emulsion, how do we start talking about the long-term performance? And the, the short story is we're moving toward a super paved type system. And this really all started with Texas A&M and NCHRP Report 680. So if you Google NCHRP Report 680, you can download any NCHRP report free of charge. It's a great resource. But take a look at the emulsion residue characterization section of this report, because it's really the nucleus for what Texas A&M has done with moving towards super pave. And that work, uh, motivated the TxDOT project 0-6166. So if you Google that first sub-bullet, FHWA backslash Texas 12 backslash report number, if you Google that, you can download this report. But what this did is it focused on chip seals. And specifically, it focused on the AASHTO R78 Procedure B, that uh, thinner 60 degrees Celsius six-hour aging in order to get your residue. And it focused on trying to quantify, can we predict if a chip seal will bleed or have aggregate loss? So using just the asphalt emulsion residue, can we predict bleeding and aggregate loss? And interestingly, I'm going to give away kind of the end of the story, because they show that MSCR showed poor field correlation. So kind of file that back in your head, because you're going to see that um, there's some some different findings from other research groups. But what Texas A&M found was, was this right here. So this is a big table, lots of words, lots of numbers. But if you look in that upper right-hand corner, which I highlighted with a red box, you can see they have SBG grades. And it's 64 minus 13, 64 minus 16, 64 minus 19. So anyone who's familiar with traditional super paved binder grades can see these emulsion type binder grades, performance graded binder grades, are kind of mimicking that style. And then if you go down the left side, you can see that they run G star sine delta and percent strain on the um, residue of asphalt emulsions. Then they put it through the PAV, and they run the uh, BBR creep and uh, stiffness. So they have a stiffness maximum, and then also a G star as well, going back to the DSR. So you can see here, essentially what Texas A&M is doing is they're creating binder grades for asphalt emulsion residue that are based on the DSR and the BBR. So some very interesting movement here in this direction. And this table is taken from that TxDOT report. So I, I highly recommend you take a look at it if you're interested. It's an, it's an excellent document with a lot of good information in it. Now, NC State has also done some work moving towards SuperPave. 
And if you Google NCHRP Report 837, you will be able to find a, a plethora of information on this, but they're also looking at performance-related specifications. And they came up with what they called Emulsion Performance Grade, or EPG. And here they looked at both chip seals and microsurfacing, and they kind of took what A&M did and went a little further. They looked at both the effect of climate and traffic in their specifications. So they have a whole host of tests on the original emulsions, and you can see there's nothing really new here with the original emulsions, but what they did with the residue was quite new. Again, they recommended using AASHTO R78 Procedure B, and we're going to start out by looking at the chip seals. So if we look at the chip seals, so chip seal is highlighted there in the top. Again, they have emulsion performance grades, EPG, of 49 minus 7, 49 minus 13. So you can see very similar to what TxDOT did, but we're, we're kind of moving toward a super paved type monk, uh, naming system. But you can see here they used MSCR. So JNR is a, one of the outputs of MSCR. So the A&M group found poor correlation between uh, MSCR and field performance. The NC State group chose to go with the um, MSCR, and they got information out of traffic levels, low traffic, medium traffic, and high traffic, and they used MSCR and then also G-STAR at certain, um, certain phase angles, critical phase angles. So this is for chip seals. They also did microsurfacing, so again, you can see these performance grades, but they have uh, different levels of JNR and for different traffics, and then they looked at, for thermal cracking, uh, a G-star at a critical phase angle as well. So there's a ton of information here, folks. I think the biggest takeaway is, one, you can download this report and read it at your leisure, and I highly recommend you do that. Uh, but two is that there is a movement when looking at asphalt emulsion residues to go toward a super paved climate-based um, grading system, and I think that's a, a good movement. But as I mentioned, Texas A&M did not recommend MSCR. NC State did recommend MSCR. So the Asphalt Institute is working on NCHRP 9-63, which is going to attempt to synthesize the results from Texas A&M and NC State. And this is still in progress. I took these from presentations given by Mike Anderson. This is not the final product. This is uh, preliminary results. So this is just for information, but things may change. And definitely keep your eye out for any presentation that Mike Anderson's giving, because he'd be able to give a more uh, complete and coherent update on this. The good news is, is they're looking at AASHTO R78, um, just like the other two groups did. And they have a preliminary draft seal EPG that's being validated in the field. They're bringing in critical temperature, T sub C. And again, please, work is progressing here. So this is something in progress. I'm just going to show you a sample of what they're thinking today. Well, actually, it was late last year, I think it was November of 2021 that I got this presentation from. But you can see, again, the emulsion performance grades, very similar to the other two, looking at the high temperature and the low temperature. And you can see here that they're looking at G-star and G-star sine delta for high temperature and low temperature. They're looking at different traffic levels, and then they're looking at the max phase angle at that critical temperature. And that's an optional test for polymer modification. Uh, at end of story, this is still in progress, but I just wanted you to know that uh, Texas A&M and TxDOT did a lot of great work, NC State did a lot of great work, and then the Asphalt Institute is trying to bridge these two products and really get the best out of both of those studies. So we, we covered a lot of ground. Uh, I'm very proud of all 183 of you who have made it to the end here. Sally did an excellent job talking about petroleum refining, asphalt binder, and emulsifiers. I talked a little bit about advanced asphalt emulsion tests and recovery methods. A couple of helpful links. If you have not been to roadresource.org, the second this webinar ends, I highly encourage you to head over there and check it out. It's a phenomenal resource, everything asphalt emulsion related. Also, FHWA has put out very good checklists. You can go to the link or just Google FHWA checklist. Make sure you get the 2019 version. That's the most um, recent. But EMA has their own website, which you can get to from roadresource.org. ASHTO has a accreditation program. And then there's a couple additional websites from roadresource.org. 
There are a couple of webinars coming up. Please stay tuned for these. One is going to be put on by ARRA on February 17th. There'll be one put on by ISSA on March 17th. Uh, please stay tuned to this. If you have any questions, put them in the chat box, and Jason will get you more information about that. But this is Sally and I's contact information. I think Jason's going to head to Q&A here. But if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot us an email, and we'd be happy to help out. But thank you very much for your presentation. I appreciate your time. Good job, Andrew. So while we're waiting for um, Jason to come back online, I saw some of the questions um, in in the chat were related to aggregates, and I, I was just going to touch on that. Uh, one of the questions was, are all aggregates negatively charged? And um, the other was basically, can you adjust the emulsifier for problem aggregates? So um, not all aggregates are negatively charged, though the majority of them are. Even you know, there was a there was a time when we thought all limestones probably had a positive charge, but it, um, some testing like the zeta potential and that sort of thing has shown that there, that some of the ions in that aggregate that, that are prefer preferentially on the surface have more of a negative charge. So that's why our cationic emul emulsifiers and anti-strips are so effective. Um, but again, if you have a particular aggregate that's causing problems, the uh, chemical supplier will know what type of emulsifiers work best for those type of aggregates. So yes, you can adjust your emulsifier um, for problem aggregates. It could be as simple as a dosage in the emulsion, or it could be that you need to look at a different chemistry to overcome whatever it is that's making that aggregate difficult. There's different um, reasons for that, so that's another presentation too. But uh, we know a lot about how these aggregates behave and also how our chemistries behave. So the emulsion manufacturer and the chemical supplier can, can definitely make things better. It's very seldom that we say, no, you can't use that aggregate. And I, I know I said Jason had help with Q&A, but I'm going to piggyback off Sally. One of the questions asked about what type of pump you want to use with asphalt emulsion in a manufacturing setting. And you want to use a gear pump or a progressing cavity pump. So these are both positive displacement rotary action type pumps. And, and the reason that you want to use either a progressive cavity pump, which is also known as a rotor and stator or a gear pump, is because you do not want to shear the asphalt droplets further while pumping. That should all be done in the um, milling process. So that's one question I Correct. saw. Yeah, biking pumps back are good side. for emulsion. Yeah. Yeah. So biking pumps are good for emulsions. So then there was, um, let's see what else we have here. Are all aggregates negatively, negatively charged? Yeah, I just addressed that. Hopefully you guys could hear me. Did, um, I think I, I addressed that already before he came back on, Jason. Thanks. Thanks, Sally. Mm -hmm. We also will open up the phone lines. And uh, Anita, if anybody has a question, feel free. Uh, Anita, if you want to say anything about phone lines. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone. A voice prompt on the phone line will indicate when your line has been opened. You may remove yourself from the queue at any time by pressing the star key followed by the digit 2. If you're using a speakerphone, please pick up the handset before pressing the corresponding digit. Once again, please press star 1 at this time. While we get questions, I want to say in the file share is the presentations for today to download as well as uh, webinar flyers for 2020 and 2021 for recordings. They're available for those that would like to review them. And please take a moment to go through the evaluations. It helps us set up future webinars, and your feedback would be greatly appreciated. 
So there was one question about uh, what emulsifiers uh, do you use, to, what has the most reduced surface tension? Um, without getting into the chemistry, all, all emulsifiers are surfactants by their nature, surface tension reducers. Um, so, but the, there's, there's different ways to manufacture these molecules to reduce the surface tension, and I can't, you know, I can't directly answer that question. Um, but certainly different types. Um, so, for instance, like when you're dealing with soaps and detergents and stuff like that, you're often dealing with non-ionic type surfactants for reducing your surface tension. So just the, like the smarty pants in our labs and stuff understand that, that process very well, which chemicals um, are best suited for that type of application. It's just differing degrees on the active head on that surfactant and what that tail looks like as well. But there's, I can't give you a direct answer. Well, Andrew and Sally, it looks like no one has any questions on the phone lines. There are no questions on the phone, sir. Thank you. Okay. See, there's a couple more Thank emails coming out. Uh, I think we've answered most of the questions in the chat. Great. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Jason, for being the MC. You did a great job, as always. Oh, you're welcome, Andrew and Sally. And now I'd like to leave it up, leave it one last, uh, one last thing for you both, uh, uh, last comment for ending our webinar for today. I would just say thanks for joining us, and um, our contact information is available, and I'm always available, as I'm sure Andrew is, to answer questions uh, at any time uh, about anything related I, to asphalt and asphalt emulsion. I, I second Sally, 100%. Great. Thanks, Sally and Andrew. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody for their time today, and state uh, Stay with us as next month uh, we're working on our presentation title. Feel free to use that website to access it. Once we get further information on the subject, uh, what's going to arrow is going to talk about, we'll have that posted. And uh, we look forward to your presence at our next webinar. With that, I'd like to everybody have a great afternoon, and we'll talk to you again. Thank you. That concludes our webinar. Thank you. That concludes our conference for today. Thank you for your participation and for using AT&T teleconference service. You may now disconnect.